Today I want to get back to our Roman study. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 7. And I want to talk to you today about the law. Uh, Paul is speaking here and, you know, in chapter 6, uh, if you think of the last verse in chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. The book of, law, the book of Romans is about salvation, folks. It's about people being saved. And the most important thing that can happen uh, to any person is for them to be saved, to them to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And that's really why uh, we went to the book of Romans because I believe with all my heart we don't have a lot of time left. I believe that Jesus' redemption is drawing nigh. And I believe there are still many, many, many lost souls so if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, let me give you the outline. Uh, number one, the authority of the law. The authority of the law. It was written for a specific purpose and a, dis a distinct time. Number two, the ministry of the law. The law has a ministry, and we will touch on that here in just a few minutes. Then number three, the sinfulness of sin. The sinfulness of sin. And one of the things that the law does, it shows us and tells us that we are sinners. And here's the key, folks. If you don't know you're a sinner, then you're not going to be saved. So we need to know that if we die in our sins, we will be separated uh, from God and we will be lost. And, and, and there's only two choices, all right? There's heaven or there, there's hell. And our job as Christians is to tell everyone about both, about both. And the book of Romans certainly does this. You know, Paul was criticized by his unbelieving Jew, uh, Jewish opponents for supposedly disregarding the Mo Mosaic law. We must remember that Paul was raised in the Jewish law and influenced heavily as a young man in Jew Jewish legalism. He understood what these Jewish leaders were thinking and taught that the law could not save anyone. The thought of Christians not being under the law, but saved by grace, was totally unacceptable to these Jewish leaders. And one of the things you have to realize, historically, folks, the New Testament had not been written yet. So all they knew was the Old Testament law. And when Paul was teaching and preaching and, and uh, studying these things, I'm telling you, it was totally new to them. It was like somebody was like a deer in the headlights, you know. It's, they just could not believe what he was saying was true. Paul literally used the whole book of Romans to prove his point that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and accepting the grace that God freely gives us. Let's look at another example of the law versus grace in Romans chapter 7. And by the way, legalism is the belief that I can become holy and please God by obeying the law. It is measuring spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. The legalist fails to understand the real purpose of God's law and the relationship between law and grace. And as Christians, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. So in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Let's look at the authority of the law. Or do you not speak, or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a, a man as long as he lives. And the difference in, and what Paul was trying to say was, when you look at the law, all of that, uh, the legalism and these rules, and, and, and by the way, folks, there were over 600 just laws that many laws, and nobody could keep all those laws. But the laws were things on the outside. They were checking boxes. They were wearing the right things. They were saying the right things. They were doing the right things. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the law cannot save you. And that's what he's saying. What he's going to try to get to uh, this uh, chapter is that the key is not what you do on the outside, the key is what's going on on the inside. Folks, anybody can say they're a Christian. Anybody can say they believe the Word of God. But one's lifestyle, 
is, is a great indication of do they know the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior. And he just lays the groundwork. If a man dies, folks, he is not under the law. Why? Because he's dead. And what he's going to compare all the way through here is a person being born again. We die to the law and we are alive unto Jesus Christ. Because see, some people get so frustrated because they do sin over and over again. And they're trying to you know, check the boxes and they're trying to live up to the law. Whereas when you truly get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and it changes your life. You're not trying to impress others. You're not trying to show people how religious you are. You're not trying to say the right thing. And, and you do the right thing and you say the right thing, but that is not your motivation. Our motivation as Christians comes from the inside and comes from pleasing God and listening to the Holy Spirit. And then he uses an example here. For the woman who has a husband is bound, up, bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And what Paul was doing, he was giving a, a Jewish uh, example, the Jewish law on marriage. And folks, he's not speaking about divorce here. This is not the issue here. He is comparing the vow, the marriage and, and the marriage law to people getting saved and, and what is going on, the law versus grace. Matter of fact, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19 speaks of the divorce laws if you want to go there. But that's not what he's, he's using this as an illustration and an example. Now look what it says. But if the husband dies, she is re released from the law of her husband. And folks, it's just like if I committed a crime and for some reason I take my own life, obviously I am not living so I will not pay the penalty of that sin. And folks, people do it all the time. But that, that is lost people, folks. That, that's lost people. And the other thing is, in the marriage, you know, what it talks about here is it's talking about, uh, you know, what frees you up. And, and really the comparison of free, freedom is when a spouse dies, you are free. Okay, you can, you know, go ahead and date somebody else. You can go ahead and marry someone else. And he is comparing that to our relationship with Jesus Christ. We are no longer under the law when we get saved. We are married to Jesus Christ. And tonight I'll be speaking of that. I mean, even James calls Christians adulterers and adulteresses. And even Jesus said, he wasn't going to let that go. He said that you, if you even look at a woman in lust, you have committed adultery in your mind. But he is talking here about the relationship of spouses and the relationship of the marriage law. They will be married forever as long as one uh, does not pass away. Verse 3, so then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from that law so that she is no adulteress, adulteress although she has been married to another man. And he just explains that there. Verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So he, that's, that verse 4 is so important. He's telling us, that we have died to the law when we got saved. Now, folks, the law is still good. We need to obey the Ten Commandments. But you think about it. From Adam to Moses, there was no law. There was none until Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments. So we simply say, and things changed there. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, everything changed. Folks, it's all about Jesus now. It is Jesus, and that's why he's saying the law versus grace. We as Christians live under grace. Now again, it's not a license to sin. Paul was trying to tell them that, all right? 
He was trying to tell him that you, that doesn't mean you can just live any way you want because the Holy Spirit is inside of you and you need to live for Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear uh, fruit unto death. Before we were saved, we lived in the flesh. Okay, we did what we wanted to do. And we were, we were not bound by the law. And folks, he is talking about lost people there. Okay? Lots of lost people don't even know they are lost. It was either the way they were raised. It's what they have learned. It's what they embraced. And they are lost there. Verse 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we, sh that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we see the difference. All right, Law versus grace. Not being saved. Being dead to the law because now we live for Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy, hold your finger there. 1 Timothy. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. I mean, folks, there are a lot of people that break laws. Some of you probably broke a law this week. All right? Why? Because you got a lead foot. You don't want to go 45 miles an hour. Why? Because this is a highway, and I want to go 55 or 60. Well, you just broke a law. Okay? Now, I, I you know, well, I better not say that. <laughs> I almost, I'm going to say it anyway. You're going to get caught eventually, okay? If you keep breaking the law, you're going to get caught. And what he is saying here, the law keeps people from putting others in danger. So the law is good, but there are so many that do not obey the law. This young man that was 18 that went into that elementary school, I'm telling you, he had no, uh, he could care less about the law. He could care less about those innocent lives. He could care less. And, and by the way, folks, I'm telling you what's going on. And you need to understand what's happening is we are getting closer and closer to the end times. This is what's going on. Because people are throwing up their hands and saying they don't understand. I'm telling you, everything that's going on in our world is going to usher in the Antichrist. You just look at it. I don't, I don't have time to go there, and that's for another time. But people are just being who they are, is what I'm trying to say. There's no restraint anymore. You are safe nowhere. You are not safe in this building. You're not safe. We do everything that we can to keep you saved. But if someone busts through those doors and starts shooting, I'm just telling you, we will react. We have people in position to help us, but you can go to Walmart. You can be standing on a corner and you're not safe anymore. Why? Because of the Antichrist, the, that the spirit of the Antichrist is coming. Now look at verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous person, but for the lawlessness and ins insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, for the profane, the murders of fathers, the murders of mothers, and for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is co contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Folks, we are not under the law anymore. Even though the law is good, the laws that we have on the books are good. I'm telling you, lawbreakers don't obey the law. But we as Christians, we obey the law. Why? Because we are under the lordship of Christ. So he's simply saying the people are being who they are. They can't help it because they don't know Jesus Christ. And the best thing that could happen in our world today is a worldwide revival where people get saved and get their hearts right with God. That's what America needs, folks. Yes, we need Christian lawmakers. Yes, we need Christians 
all that. You fill in the blank. Yes, we need that. But this world needs a huge dose of Jesus. Galatians 5. He's talking about lawbreakers there. Let's look on the other side of the coin here. Look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Folks, we have a choice every day of life. Are we going to walk in the Spirit, or are we going to walk in the flesh? There are people everywhere walking in the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And folks, it doesn't mean we don't have to obey the law. It simply means we have another law. We have the Spirit of God working inside of us. Folks, if we would listen to the Holy Spirit, you would not be sinless or perfect But I'm telling you, you would walk in the Spirit, and you would be a better person. But some people, even Christians, matter of fact, next next week, well, the week after that, I forgot, next week is a Gideon speaker, but the week after that, Paul is sharing with, with us the struggles that he has. Folks, it takes work to be a Christian. You can't let your guard down. And what some people do, they just they, they think the law is going to save them and they think the law is going to mold and make them and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we need is Jesus Christ and we need to walk in the Spirit. Folks, I'm telling you, if all Christians would just walk in this Spirit, we would be a better country and we would be a better person. So we see the authority of the law. We, we died. When we got saved, we died to the law and we married Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ, says Revelation. So we see the authority of the law. Now let's look at the ministry of the law. The ministry of the law. Back in Romans chapter 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay? And Again, he's talking about these Jewish leaders that were raised in the law, and all they know is the law. Then what they were thinking was, well, then the law is sin. Okay, the law makes you sin. And let me give an answer to that right away. Nobody makes you sin. You choose to sin. Okay, I mean, that is a choice. And every day you have that choice. And the law is not bad. Look what his answer is. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. There's, it's, not it's, it's not sin. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Then he gives an example. For I would have not known covetousness against the law unless the law had said, you shall not covet. It's like the rich young ruler in the New Testament that went to Jesus and said, hey, what do I have to do to uh, uh, have eternal life? And remember what he said? I obey my parents, I obey the laws, I've done all this and I've done all that. And what did he say? Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. What was this guy's problem? It was money, folks. He cared more about his money. And folks, that's what covetousness is. It's wanting more. It's wanting somebody else's things. It's living for money. And Jesus knew that. So Paul just picked out one. He said, you can can use all of them. Folks, uh, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. I mean, we've all broke that law. Even though this guy said, man, I've I've kept these from my youth. That one thing, because the Bible says he walked away sad because he would not give up his attitude towards money. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. It's like this. Uh, When somebody says, (laughs) I've seen this happen more than once, there's some fresh paint on something, and there's a sign that says, do not touch. What does your sin nature do? Oh, man. Nobody makes you do that. 
That's the sin nature inside of you. And the law, I mean, again, it's just a sign. But it shows that without Jesus Christ, we can't overcome anything, folks. That lure of sin. What do you think uh, Satan did? The deceiver did with Eve. See this piece of fruit? If you'll take a bite of that fruit, you will be like God. And folks, that sin nature is in us. We want to sin. We do sin. And it cost uh, Adam and Eve, it cost us deeply. Matter of fact, hold your finger there and go to Psalm 51 with me. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Folks, the Holy Spirit tells us when we have sinned. David is crying out to God. David, I mean, he did the big two in sin. He committed adultery and he committed murder. Even as the king of Israel. The Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. But I'm telling you, it wasn't the law. The law was written then. David knew you shouldn't commit adultery and you shouldn't uh, murder. But yet his passions, his flesh, his lust led to both of these things. And he's saying, God, cleanse me of my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. God convicts us of our sin through the Holy Spirit. It's not one of them things as, well, I, I might have sinned. I might have said, no, you know whether you've sinned or not, folks. The Holy Spirit inside of you tells you, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have that attitude. You shouldn't be that way. And my sin is always before me against you and only you have I sinned and done this evil in the sight of you that you're, you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And folks, we are under the divine protection of God. We know God. We, we are experiences of uh, God's mercy, and we are experiences of God's grace. So it's not something that we do not know. And look at verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Man, you don't have to teach people to sin. You were born to sin. Tell a toddler not to do something. Tell them not to touch your television remote. We were sitting there the other night, and Lori was doing something, and uh, her phone went off. And, it, and I don't know all this. I don't have an iPhone. But I looked up, and it said FaceTime. And I look up, and, and it's Kylie. She's two years old. And you know what she did? She took Jonathan's phone and knew how to FaceTime, and had there like that. I hear Jonathan come in the room, what are you doing with my phone again? Why? She wanted to play with the phone. We, and folks, we do this. We flirt with sin, knowing that we shouldn't do this. And that's what he's saying. You know, just knowing that the law is there doesn't change Okay, uh, you know, and, and again, folks, it, it's the difference of outwardness, which is the law, and inwardness, which is the Spirit of God. And, and you know, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but Jonathan hit the erase button or whatever you do. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what I, I still haven't asked him what went on after that. But she obviously is not supposed to be playing with phones at two years old. All right? And so we have to understand every one of us are sinners. Every one of us are going to be tempted by sin. And the bottom line is, folks, just knowing the law doesn't change that. Just knowing that we should not do it will not change you. And see, that's why there's so much frustration. I think one of the things uh, that people struggle with a lot of times is whether or not they're saved. Whether or not they're saved. And why? Because 
deep inside they want to do the right thing, but they find themselves doing the wrong thing and not feeling saved. Well, listen, folks, we don't walk you know, with feelings. We're not talking about feelings here. And I understand, you know, some people are emotional, some people have that, but as Christians, we walk by faith. And the frustration in these folks' lives is, I try to keep the law, I try to keep the law, I try to keep the law, maybe I need to be saved. And let me tell you a good way you can know whether you're saved. Does sin bother you? Do you come under conviction of sin? Listen to me, every time you sin. Folks, you can't get by with it. David couldn't get by with it. God, through Nathan, said, you are the man, you are the one that I am talking about. And David had to come clean, and we know the rest of Psalm 51, he did that. Now let's look back in our text. Verse 9. Verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin uh, revived and I died. Folks, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean uh, you know, you're going to make the right decision every time. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found brings death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Again, you know, there's two things. A lost person who is deceived by Satan and never makes a decision for Christ. Folks, when they die, they will spend an eternity in hell. But it's also to the Christian. And it's that thing. It's, it's, it's saying that, man, I don't feel saved. I don't feel you know, uh, you know, uh, filled with the Spirit. Man, my walk with the Lord is not what it needs to be. And then verse 12, Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And what he's trying to say, the problem is not the law, folks. The problem is sin. We all have a sin problem. Nobody is exempt. When, when you get saved, that doesn't take away that flesh and those evil desires. It's just that through going to church and reading your Bible and praying and going, uh, telling others and witnessing, all right, you get to where you are strong in your faith and you are strong in the Lord so that you don't sin. Not being perfect, but you just you don't do blatant sins. You trust the Spirit of God inside of you. You walk with God. You don't follow the flesh. You say no to the flesh, and you say let, yes to the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. It's amazing how many times Paul said, especially in the book of Romans, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the Scripture has confi uh, confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Folks, that promise is Jesus Christ. We accept that promise through faith. We live out our faith. That's what believe is. Believe is living out your faith. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which we would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we may be, might be justified by faith. Folks, everyone before Jesus Christ had to be saved by faith, and they had to be saved knowing that Jesus Christ would come. The cross had not even happened yet, but they lived by faith, and it was so much harder during those days to believe in something that was supposed to come than us knowing Jesus has already come, and he has died on the cross and was resurrected and is at the right hand of God. But after faith has come, we are no longer a tutor or no longer under the law. So he's just saying, yes, there is a purpose 
in the law. There is the ministry of the law. It tells us what's right and wrong. It, it, it has you know, a purpose in what we do, but it's not what changes us, folks. It is the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we see the authority of the law. We see the ministry of the law. And then the last verse, we see the sinfulness of sin. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. Folks, the law cannot save us from sin. It can't do, it can't do that. And, and we must understand that it is Christ in us. It is us dying to self. It is us surrendering everything to Jesus Christ. And we as Christians should get as far away from sin as we possibly can. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through, through what is good, so that sin through the commandment by, might become exceedingly sinful. Folks, the law is good, but it cannot save you. The law doesn't cause spiritual death. Sin does. Sin, uh, it, it's, its deadly character uh, exposes the law. It, it, it just tells us that the laws are of God are true. The purpose of the law, and this is it, folks, was to point people to Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the law. And when you think about it, Folks, the Bible is everything to us. It is everything. It's what we believe. It's who we are. It's salvation. It's God breathed. All right, and we need to follow the, you know, uh, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Psalm 119. Go with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Folks, we need to be in the word as Christians. We need to start our day in the word. We need to end our day in the word with God speaking to us. Verse uh, 10, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me. Oh, let me not wander from your commandment. Folks, we put our heart into a lot of things. We put our heart into our families. We put our heart into our marriages. We put our heart into jobs. Some people put their heart into sports. But we as Christians need to serve the Lord God with our whole heart so that sin will not have an influence over us. Look at verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statues. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as, as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statues. I will not forget your word. Folks, sin will keep you from your Bible or your Bible will keep you from sin. So Paul is saying, some of you have these list of rules that you have and you're trying to live by the law and you're trying to fulfill the law. Folks, Jesus is the only one that lived a perfect life and fulfilled the law. And now what we have to do, we have to uh, depend on the Spirit of God. We have to depend on the Word of God. And we have to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you so much. And, and I understand the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. We need to obey laws. But God, the key right now is the Spirit of God. And God, I pray that if there's one person here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. They can't work their way into heaven. They can't clean up enough or be good enough to be accepted. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that pays for our sin. And God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you, that they would come down this aisle, they would take us by the hand and simply say, 
I need Jesus today. I want to give Jesus my life and my heart. And God, I pray for the Christian. I do believe many Christians are struggling. They're struggling with the rules and try to be good. And, and Lord, they're trying to check the boxes. But God, I pray that they would be spirit-filled Christians. God, I pray they would uh, just uh, cling to the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that they would spend more time in your word. And God, I pray that they wouldn't be frustrated trying to be, uh, you know, this super Christian, but they would just depend on you, God, that they would just relax in you, and God, that they would just please you in everything they do. Lord, if there's one here that needs to follow you in baptism, or join this church, or even surrender to missions or some special thing, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you in any way, would you come?